Hello, welcome to another uh, uh, episode of Cricket Courage. Uh, today we have Grace Chen McKibben. <laughs> I worked hard at saying that really well. We are so glad to have her. Um, for those of you that are watching, this is United Church of Hyde Park and we live in the Hyde Park area of the south side of Chicago. And today we are interviewing someone from our community, our neighborhood, Grace. And so it's so good to have her uh, with us today. Um, I'm not sure what her story is of how we met. And it's funny when you ask people how you met, they may have two different understandings, but I, I think it was actually in Hyde Park. Um, and there was this meeting on um, uh, immigration. I think it was when we were experiencing kind of an outrage at some of the ways in which we were treating people on the borders. And so there was a group of people that got together and I remember you being at that meeting and, and having a very critical voice and having a lot of passion. It may not have been the first time, but that's kind mm -hmm. of what rises to my memory of kind of meeting you. So it's good. Um, we've had some other opportunities to be in each other's midst and it's great having you here today. And so just want to ask you, how long have you been a member? How long have you been in Hyde Park? How long have I been in Hyde Park? Yeah, I was just answered that question recently uh, with the folks. I actually came to Hyde Park in 1986 to be an undergraduate student and didn't really think that I would stay this long. Um, so I stayed, I finished my undergrad, stayed for grad school, um, got married, have children. Yeah, and just continue, and just continue to, stay. to stay, yeah. So where did you come from before you got to Hyde Park, mm -hmm. Chicago? Yeah, I grew up in Hong Kong and uh, uh, was in Hong Kong until I was 16. And mm -hmm. I won a two-year academic scholarship to attend a boarding school on the East Coast in the Boston area. And um, the way that I usually tell my story is that when you're 16, it seems like a really good idea to put 9,000 miles between yourself and your parents. And then you didn't realize that you spent the rest of your life, the rest mm -hmm. of your life, trying to figure out how to get back closer with your parents. My dad just passed away suddenly um, in the middle of January, mm -hmm. and so I had to go back for the funeral in early February, and it was a pretty rude awakening because I knew that that could happen. That mm -hmm. once you leave and make your life somewhere else that you may not be able to see your mm -hmm. parents again, mm -hmm. but it was um, because you passed so suddenly, it was very um, difficult and shocking. Yeah, yeah. I think I remember on Facebook you were traveling when we started hearing a little bit about COVID and, mm -hmm. and so, I, you know, you get pieces of people's lives on social media, so I don't know that I knew why you were traveling, but I knew you were traveling in the midst of mm -hmm. Yep. some of the breaking news to Hong Kong. Um, well, that's nice to know. So I'm curious when you got here to America, you know, how, what was most shocking about American culture to you as a 16 year old? Hmm. That's a good question. Well, I went to a school in Hong Kong that was started by American nuns, by mm -hmm. Catholic nuns, by the Marino sisters in New York who are very missionary minded and definitely much more open than most other um, than most other groups. So, you know, I kind of had a more open upbringing to begin with. And, and then I attended a Protestant church that mm -hmm. was English speaking. So there are some lifestyle things that I am already familiar with, but um, just the openness, the casualness, and um, um, there isn't as much um, can I put it in Asian East Asian culture in particular? You always know your your place uh, in terms of your relationship with other people, position, whether they are older than you are or younger, and gender, and so on. There are very defined roles, and Americans, as we um, are stereotypically kind of more casual, but I think that's um, surprising. Um, the um, um, casualness of you know teenagers drinking, smoking, and all that was also very surprising because um, that um, if there was an undercurrent of that culture, it was quite hidden in mm -hmm. East Asia. Yeah. Okay. And now that you've been here for so many years, what was maybe shocking or surprising for you as you go back to uh, Hong Kong? Mm -hmm. I, um, I think 
just how crowded it is usually. I mean, you know that there's the population density, but uh, usually every time that I'm in Hong Kong, I'm surprised that the mass transit, the MTR, mm -hmm. is always busy, whether it's day or night. Mm -hmm. And here, when we talk about uh, people being uh, close together, it's not the same density. There are streets in Hong Kong, if you go shopping um, in the middle of the city, you could um, literally not um, need to walk because there are people that close to you that as the crowd moves, the entire room moves. Um, mm -hmm. So I think those things are shocking and not comfortable because mm -hmm. you know, I'm not, not really used to that now. Mm -hmm. I'm used to having more of a distance. Um, I have always been, even growing up as a child, not really liked the the more, what I said, you know, more mm -hmm. um, people needing to, to, to know their place and people not being able to speak up. So I think that um, every time that I'm there, I need to kind of check myself and again, remember mm -hmm. how things, um, what expectations are. So when did you know that you were really going to stay here as opposed to going back home and how did that happen for mm -hmm. you? Yeah, well, I've always wanted to leave. <laughs> Um, you didn't get that before. Right. Yeah, <laughs> always wanted to leave, knowing that you know a very, very hom homogeneous and very Chinese culture isn't something that I would be comfortable with. Um, mm. I, you know, I have curly brown hair. I'm much darker than most Chinese people, and so I've always been pretty othered as I was growing up. I remember, you know. Um, older relatives meaning while coming up to my parents and say, oh, you know, it's a pity that Grace is so dark, you know, and things like that, right? Or, or they mean while it is, um, and we come up and say, oh, looks like you're getting fairer recently, you know, like, like as if, as if, yeah. So stuff like that is um, a little bit uncomfortable. And um, I think that um, just uh, the stereotype is that the U.S. is so much fairer, you know, there's democracy, there's more equality. And I think the shock is really now that we really see how um, how inequalities have persisted and how mm -hmm. it, you know the, the our brand of democracy really doesn't work all that well that we keep selling it to other people and you know I think that if I were somebody watching the U.S. from a different country now I would really not be able to um, to accept that. Um, mm -hmm. You say that you're able to vote to get people out, and look, you're not able to get people out. And mm -hmm. you know, you say that you have checks and balances that will prevent um, mm -hmm. certain things from happening, and it doesn't seem to be the case. So, yeah. wow, <laughs> yeah, a lot, you know, has happened um, in America. I would say just in the last three elections that mm -hmm. we've had, and just kind of our whole. A kind of political front that you know if nothing else should cause people to like pause for a minute because um and even now this election it's really mind-boggling um so uh we've just been in a space uh, but to flip it just a little bit what uh do you do for fun what do i do for fun um, all of this craziness how do how do you remain uh, sane yeah um I have several passions. Um, I like music. I like classical music a lot, and I, I sing. I play the piano, mm -hmm. and I try to um, prioritize um, getting the opportunities to sing. Um, I cook. Um, that's uh, one of my creative passions: mm -hmm. cook, cooking and baking. Um, I do make some things. I mean, I like crafts. I, I am one of these people that um, like to pick up new things. Um, I, pick up hobbies and I'm not always good about sustaining them. Mm -hmm. I'm really, really bad about finishing the projects that I start. Mm -hmm. And um, But cooking is one of the things, cooking or baking is one of the things because it's time limited. You can't start and not finish. You know, there's a, you know, there's dinner time. There's, you know, you need to take the cake out when, when the timer beeps, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of stuff that, you know, keeps people that are kind of like me that like to start a million things mm -hmm. kind of in check mm -hmm. and be able to finish doing something that's creative. Yeah, so in case you guys uh, don't know, um, I'm Facebook friends with Grayson. She cooks a lot of stuff that really, really looks good. So, uh, you know, I don't know if you want to brag or pat yourself on the back or, I, and I noticed lately, like, you've been doing ice cream, I mean, and just a whole array of Southern comfort food, you know, some Asian delicacy, I mean, 
things. Yeah. You I get think, around. You know, I think um, another one of my passions is just people and culture and, you know, and like languages and so on. I think I've noticed that I'm a linguist by academic training mm -hmm. and I've noticed that a lot of linguists also are passionate about food and culture because that's one window into different, mm -hmm. you know, into different cultures by cooking or creating a dish from a different culture. That's one way of experiencing mm -hmm. um, a culture that's different from your own. So I think that that's what I like. And um, so I get a little bit snooty about it. Like yesterday, um, I made a sugar-free birthday cake for my husband. But the day before, I was at the farmer's market and I got very attracted by these muffins that I was like, oh, you know, I want one of each kind. And then when we got home and we um, um, ate those, they were very sweet. Mm -hmm. And um, my husband's like, they are so sweet. And, you know, the snooty side of Grace says something like, you know, there is no other flavor than sweetness in these muffins. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> Because I, I take my cooking and everything so seriously that sometimes mm -hmm. I do get disappointed if I buy something that I think that it would be one way and it's not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. You know, we were talking, um, well, you were talking just about America and democracy. Um, we now have COVID on the home front and um, COVID seems to have just, we, we use this word a lot, a new normal. Mm -hmm. And in that word a little bit, um, I don't know as a linguist where it, where it takes you, but um, COVID has seen, seemingly taken a lot away in terms of mm -hmm. community and contact and being able to touch people and, you know, be in relationships. Um, but today I saw someone post five things that COVID had given to them. And I don't know, are there three things that you could think of that even in the midst of this kind of despair that COVID has given to you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. I think uh, several things. One is, you know, um, in the very beginning, being um, kind of forced to stay at home to work means that uh, I got to, if not spend more time, at least be in the same space with my family. Mm -hmm. um, I am, uh, I am a very extroverted person. I'm always out. I'm always doing things, um, either my own work in the community or other stuff. So I'm out pretty much most evenings and a lot of weekends. And so when the shelter in place or the stay at home order first started, I suddenly find myself at home every evening. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one of the blessings, right? That even if I'm not um, really doing um, specific things with my mm -hmm. family, and as it turned out because of different circumstances, we actually had uh, three of our four children back at home um, Mm -hmm. at one point so you know for the first time we have five people under one roof which is or for the first time in a long time we have five people under one roof which is mm -hmm. a blessing mm -hmm. um i think that covid also uncovers you know all these vulnerabilities my husband is a scientist um and um uh so he and he loves science fiction he's like you know every time he puts on the mask is a huge reminder of how mm -hmm. vulnerable people mm -hmm. are, mm -hmm. right? that we're literally living on a planet where there's a, a, where there are things that would attack us if we don't put our protective gear on. I think that it's a reminder to mm -hmm. treasure the things that we have. And then the third thing is that um, COVID does uncover a lot of systemic, um, uh, systemic, I won't say breakages, but uh, systems that we rely on, I think that would last forever, where they don't work as well as we do. There are all these fragilities and all these places where things are not um, linked up, but then that gave rise to creativity. People are able to come up with new systems or new ways of doing things. And I think that's the third blessing. So when we one day get out of this nightmare, um, um, this uh, nightmare on so many levels, but I'm referring to COVID in particular, um, what do you think you would like to carry moving forward with you? Um, mm -hmm. How has this made you maybe a, a better human being? Yeah, I think the last point that I just made, mm -hmm. um, the fact that we as human beings are much more creative and versatile and um, resilient than we give ourselves credit for mm -hmm. um, because of COVID, it uncovered all these systems that don't work mm -hmm. and ways that we think should be this way just because it was this way mm -hmm. before. I think that um, if anything, COVID has reminded us that we need to look at everything with fresh eyes every day so that we can see what new possibilities there are, whether they're 
ways to do this differently, whether there are ways to do this better than you've always done it before. Yeah, yeah. So on your Facebook page, I think it was you, I saw all these books in the background. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think, um, you know, one day somebody was kind of describing what a high Parker looks like. But I think if we were to list three things about a high Parker, one of them would be reads a lot of books. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I'm curious to know, what are you reading now? What am I reading now? I'm not enough fun things. Actually, last night I was just trying to figure out what the latest fun um, thing to read a page turner would be uh, because on my night table I have um, Hannah Gray who's the pre former president of the University of Chicago. I have her autobiography. Ooh, wow. I have um, a new book from the ACLU that celebrates the 100th anniversary that just got sent to national board members. I, I have a book about Dorothy Day and her mm -hmm. life, a biography. Mm -hmm. And then something else on um, something else on you know management or something. So I'm like hmm, you know too many too many serious things. I need something fun. I'm uh, not surprisingly since I said that I start projects all the time. I'm one of these people that have five or six sometimes five or six physical books plus one or two mm -hmm. ebooks open um, in progress at any given time. So yeah, I think I need to add something fun and lighthearted. That much. Yeah, yeah. Well, sometimes I think memoirs can be fun. Um, I just finished reading Cornel West. I'm like, what is up with him? So I just, you know, he has a memoir out. Um, uh, I think it's called Loving Out Loud, Loving and Out, something with L's in it. Um, but I just finished it and it was, you know, I find memoirs kind of help me to understand um, a person's formation, their origins, and Kind of how they tick, what guides them. And so it kind of really gave me an appreciation uh, for uh, where he's coming from. And so like one of the things he said in the book is like he calls everyone a brother or a sister. It might be challenged with our whole gender construction thing, but um, he sees each person as somebody he's connected to and a human being. And so it just was like, oh, I think I think I can kind of feel this. But so you're reading about 11 books at one time, four on a nightstand and <laughs> so seven on a... <laughs> Probably five or six, yeah. Oh gosh, well, um, let me see if I have any questions I've missed with you. So this is an interesting question I wrote down. What is something people... Um, so first of all, Grace is a very public figure and a very um, political figure, perhaps. And so one of the things we're doing on Cricket Courage is trying to, you know, really help people share their stories and their humane side and say, hey, we're all human beings. So what is one thing you might want people to know that they might not know about you? It's a little bit more below the surface. A little bit more below the surface. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. Well, a lot of, well, I, I think um, uh, one thing that, uh, folks may not know is that I can be really silly. Um, one of the things that I like to tell my young staff is that you know you may want to you always want to take your work seriously, but don't take yourself too seriously. I think that a lot of times people that are all wound up is because they get too worried about, you know, whether um, whether they're doing the right thing or not. And coming growing up in East Asian culture, as mm -hmm. I said, um, there are all these expectations and it's very easy to um, just always um, live your life for other people rather than mm -hmm. for yourself. Mm -hmm. And I am, you know, a workaholic and I work all the time and it is difficult sometimes to look back and, you know, to sit back and relax. Mm -hmm. But yeah, but when I'm silly, I can be very silly. So I think that that's one of the things that I like people to know about me. Okay. So we got someone silly with us. <laughs> um, yeah. So. I'm curious to know what are labels that are important to you. This may sound a little bit odd, but sometimes people give us labels and they can be empowering and sometimes they can be oppressive. And then there are labels that we we give ourselves that mean something, whether it's identifying as a daughter or I, you know, um, identifying in terms of ethnicity or religion or something you're passionate about. Um, what, what are some labels um, that you take on, that you give to yourself that 
help us to understand who you are? Hmm. Um, yeah, I, I think I consider it important that I, that I'm Chinese, that mm -hmm. you know, Chinese ethnicity is important. There are all these things that are wrapped up in it. I, I'm a Hong Kong Chinese. I grew up in Hong Kong and in the, in the 1980s. So there's a particular mm -hmm. culture and a particular outlook and, um, given how complex the relationship between Hong Kong and China is right now, there's, you know, it takes on a, a new, different meaning. Um, I, uh, consider it important to be a progressive, um, mm -hmm. and to, um, always push against the envelope of what we think is, um, is, um, important uh, or push against the envelope of what we think we're doing in terms of making progress and, mm -hmm. you know towards in particular towards equality fairness justice all of that i think that's important i consider it very important that i'm a mother i'm a mother of four children and they are very important to me mm -hmm. um, there are various different challenges in along that journey and um and but i think that is um for me is important to embrace that part of, of my life. Um, when the children were much younger, I always think about my life as um, balancing the, the mm -hmm. three parts, like a tripod, you know, work and and family and community, or, uh, and community can include church as well as other uh, communities. And um, I think that as the children get older and are not in need of us anymore, sometimes it's harder to figure out what that part means, mm -hmm. um, and uh, so need to constantly reevaluate. Like recently, I've noticed that you know work has become much much more important, and uh, work and community has gotten all merged, you know, together. So mm -hmm. we need to figure out that you know that family piece. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, now um, the. Uh, the DNC, and I'm trying not to do politics, but the DNC just, you know, um, announced and we accepted Kamala Harris as running for VP. Um, and it's come up, you know, that part of her heritage is Asian mm -hmm. and that her mom is Indian. Um, do, how, is that significant, um, possibly significant for the Asian community? And I ask you, does that mean anything or what possibly does it mean for you as um, um, someone that... Um, you know, um, takes the label being Chinese very important. Yeah, I think it's important for the Asian community. It depends on the, you know, how political people are, but I think that representation matters, seeing somebody that looks like you and identifies with your culture or cultures that are similar to yours is important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My children all identify as Chinese and black, and mm -hmm. they are very vocal about it, that they, they are, um, when people ask them what they are, they'll be, um, they say they never use half Chinese and half black because they're like, you know, nobody mm -hmm. is half anything. You're all mm -hmm. fully human being. And, um, mm -hmm. but they, yeah, they're very, um, um, conscious about the fact that the Chinese culture is a large part of their culture. And I think that, um, as somebody who likes people and culture languages and so on, it is important to know um where you come from and what mm -hmm. part what cultures you draw from and uh, so i think it's significant um that somebody of asian descent is being nominated to be vice president mm -hmm. yeah I, I wanted to be silly and say i don't know how your uh, family feels with their you know uh commitment to fair skin you know <laughs> You kind of, you know, messed your kids up, you know, a little with the complexion thing. So that's just a little bit of a of a joke. Did your kids kind of come to that space of saying, hey, this is my identity? Or did the parents help them evolve? Or kind of was this just their own journey? Yeah, I think that both of us are pretty conscious about, you know, bringing our cultures to the table, celebrating all the different traditions. So mm -hmm. that, that helps um, in terms of, yeah, uh, uh, in terms of um, other kinds of identity. I think that the Asian and Black combination is rare enough that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they often find themselves the only person in their immediate mm -hmm. circles or one or two people with that heritage and um, so they find themselves explaining quite a mm -hmm. bit. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, because of coming from mixed heritage, they also um, 
find that is important to um, we all know that race is a social construct, but I think that if you come from a mixed heritage, it's even more apparent that, mm -hmm. you know, that uh, there are, there have always been people that are mixed. I think that the racial purity is more of a, a myth, like, you know, how did, how did a girl that grew, grew up in Southern China end up having, um, end up having curly brown hair, mm -hmm. you know, because <laughs> wavy brown hair is because somebody um, a long time ago, didn't mm -hmm. have didn't have straight black hair, right? So I think that's those are the important lessons. Yes, yes. Um, wow, wow. So um, generally, before I get to my last question, I want to make sure uh, uh, I um, get everything off my list, I and mean, I think I I have. Um, so one of my off questions is, what is the first thing you do when you wake up in the morning? The first thing I do when I wake up in the morning? It depends. I've been trying to get up and exercise, mm -hmm. um, not always successfully. I have a really bad habit of grabbing my phone first, which is always bad mm -hmm. because then you end up being inundated with either emails or whatever else that is there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, I'm sure a lot of people reach for the phone or some kind of gadget. And then my last question for you um, that I just ask everybody that's uh, on Cricket Courage is what is on your bucket list of things to do? I mean, you, um, you've, you know, been in politics and you've definitely um, sown some seeds uh, here in Chicago uh, and you've, you know, raised your kids. Um, the formative years now are behind you. And as you say, you're, you know, getting more involved in your work, but, you know, with the time you have left, um, is there anything you have on your bucket list that you'd like to do? I've always liked to travel. And so whenever we're out of this um, COVID madness, I'd like to be able to travel internationally and mm -hmm. see a lot of different places. Um, and, um, I think that would be one of the important things that I would want to do. So on Cricket Courage, we invite our uh, Cricket Courage folks <laughs> to share some of uh, themselves with us. And so Grace has agreed uh, generously to share her cross stitching. So take it away, Grace. Thank you. Yeah, as I said before, I'm not primarily a crafter. I don't always finish the projects that I start. But I want to share uh, several pieces. Two of them are made by somebody else and two by, by myself. So when I uh, first had my first daughter, uh, Jessica, who was born in 93, my pastor's wife made this cross stitch. It's the baby record with the name and uh, date of birth and weight. And then she made the second one when I had my second child, same rabbit. Um, and then she moved away when I had my third child. So I decided that I would make one myself for the third child who actually has since had a gender change so they no longer have this name um, and then my fourth child I decided I'm also one of these very perfectionist people that can't have things that are incomplete so because there are three there must be a fourth so I also made this one for my youngest child well, I mean, this is really uh, exciting. I was sharing with Grace before we started that um, in my earlier days, I also cross-stitch. And so I find it neat, uh, the different forms. We have a member that cross-stitch. I'm Grace. And uh, so it's neat that you did one. So as I understand it, that your uh, pastor's wife did the first two. Mm -hmm. And because you're a Methodist at heart, maybe. <laughs> You know, you, every, you wanted every child to feel this specialness mm -hmm. of their own. So, uh, nice. Uh, what other cross-stitching have you done? I've made a few um, door hanger type pieces. Mm -hmm. And, uh, no, I haven't done a lot of crafting the past 10 years or so. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. one of the things, you know, talking about bucket lists, you know, if I uh, do get to retire or slow down a little bit, I'd like to do some more crafting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, your eyes really have to be good, so we know that Grace uh, sees on many different levels because you have to have good eyes to do good cross-stitching. So thank you so much for being with us today.